Right now, this is Mark Kahn, who's going to be doing a little chalk talk for us. Um, he holds the Edward S. Cooper, Norman Roosevelt, and Elizabeth Meriwether McLaur professorship at the University of Pennsylvania um, in their Department of Medicine. Um, he's a cardiovascular researcher who has been with Angioma Alliance at our science meetings for a very long time and has um, provided us some of the most important insights into CCM biology, including the information that we all know now about the microbiome. That's what has come out of his lab. So he's going to share with you some of the most recent findings. All right. Thanks, Connie. Everyone hear me okay? Yes. So we're just going to do this old school. No slides. I got a chalkboard here. Um, you guys can interrupt with questions. So as Connie said, my lab's worked on this disease on a basic level for quite some time. I think uh, we published our first paper actually 2009 in Nature Medicine, so more than 10 years now. Um, and you know, during that time, what, what we have worked on primarily is mouse genetic models that um, we're fortunate you know, both us and I think the community, that these models have been very faithful in their ability to reproduce the disease. That's quite unusual for most diseases in mice. Um, but um, we're lucky in that, you know, if we delete these genes in neonatal animals, we get lesions that look like the lesions that patients get, you know, later in life. And so um, what I'll talk to you a little bit about today is some work that we started uh, quite a few years ago. You know, we had developed this model, and uh, we had generated a number of genetically modified mice that would allow us to sort of control when and where the genes get deleted. Now, as you all know, in patients, this happens in a very random, stochastic manner. And so it's really a matter of luck, good or bad, as to whether something happens. Of course, in mice, when you want to, do, when you want to learn something, you need to have it highly reproducible. And so we rely on genetic tools that allow us to delete the gene, not just in one, but in many endothelial cells in the brain. And we, you know, we've developed these tools over a long period of time. And so um, we were working on this. And after developing the system and showing that it could reproducibly generate CCM lesions in mice, by chance, you know, the, I was at the University of Pennsylvania, and my, they built a new research building. And uh, you know, we started a new vascular center for biology, and we, we moved our lab into a new floor of this research building. And when we moved, all of our mice moved with us. And they moved from a housing facility in building one to the housing facility in building two. And you know, we didn't think much of it at the time. Of course, it was a little bit of a pain, because everything gets slowed down when you move. But then what happened was about a few months after we arrived in the new building, we began to, you know, our experiments were up and running again, and we were generating new animals in this new facility. And when we did the same genetic experiments that we had done previously, we found that we weren't getting the same results. In fact, what was happening is more and more of the litters and the new animals generated in the facility would undergo the same genetic deletion that we had engineered previously. And these are the same exact strains of mice. But now they wouldn't develop any lesions. And this was a very dramatic change in the phenotype. You know, there were animals that would have severe lesion formation in only about 10 days to animals that had nothing. And at first, um, to be perfectly honest, as we finished off a couple of papers, this was just a problem. You know, we, um, we knew that we went through a lot of genetic work to make sure there hadn't been a shift in what we call the background strain, which is sort of all the other genes in the mouse that could, you know, through some mechanism not yet described, affect the function of this pathway. But, um, but we, you know, we didn't find any genetic obvious cause for this change. And, and so that made us focus on environmental issues. And this is interesting because, you know, you would think that you know, uh, that the disease arises because of a genetic change in endothelial cells that lie in the brain, that, you know, maybe the environment wouldn't be so important. And certainly that wasn't something that we or others in the field had set out to investigate. But what this serendipitous finding told us was that there was something in the environment that was very important. And so, um, you know, there are only a few things that change in the environment when you move, and the microbiome is one of them. 
Um, and, and the way we knew it was probably the microbiome was, again, through a fortuitous but important result. The way we generate our mouse models is we have to inject them with a drug to induce the gene deletion. Otherwise, they will die in embryogenesis. If you're totally deficient in this pathway early in life, you don't make it for reasons that are, we've also investigated in depth. And so uh, we found that when we injected these animals, you know, we injected neonates by poking them in the abdomen with a needle. Every now and then, we would have a litter where, as, as we'd observed, most of the animals with the appropriate genotype were not getting lesions. But then one animal would show very robust lesion formation, sort of like the old days back in the old facility. And, and what we found out was that that animal almost inevitably had developed what's called an abscess, which is a bacterial infection, in their, in their abdomen. And the abscess comes from when you, you know, put a needle into the abdomen, sometimes it will pass through the gut wall transiently, and then some bacteria will leak, and they can start to grow and form a, an infection. So what we found was that if, in, on the rare case that there was a bacterial infection, it seemed to be rescuing the formation of this phenotype in animals that otherwise wouldn't get it. And we say that because their litter mates also, they didn't get it. So we, we followed this up. And what we found was if we gave them an infection, we could indeed induce a very severe phenotype. And so that led us to think that the environmental effect was a change in the bacteria that was living in, in the animal. Now, you know, you all know that we've got literally billions with a B of bacteria that live in a sort of, a, you know, homeostatic way in our gut. And, um, there, you know, we now know that there's a lot of effort. The, the bacteria do a lot of good things for our bodies, and, of course, we maintain them and do a lot of good things for them when we eat. But there's a, you know, the, and there's a, there's, there, are, there are the possibility that these bacteria can also contribute to disease. So, you know, we, we followed up on this finding regarding the bacteria to test whether bacterial stimuli might actually be an important part of disease. And I won't go through the experiments, but we did a bunch of genetic experiments that identified a very well-known, probably the most well-known receptor for a bacterial product, a toll-like receptor that responds to gram-negative bacteria, and that is very ancient because gram-negative bacteria are the kind that cause the most dangerous form of sepsis. And they're, you know, they live in our, in our colons in very large numbers. So we found that, that that mechanism was the most important mechanism driving CCM formation in mice. So that was quite important. And um, you know, we wanted to know whether that was also the case in people. And we were lucky. Um, you know, studies that were being done on, on people in New Mexico uh, and elsewhere, but primarily focused on families in New Mexico with CRIT1 mutation was asking a, a, a similar type of question, although we at the time didn't realize it was a similar type of question. And the question was, you know, if you have all these different families in New Mexico that have the identical genetic mutation, how come some people are getting terrible disease and some people skating through not even knowing they have a disease? And, and you know, so this variability is, is, is quite high and, and unusual for a classic genetic disease. You know, the classic genetic disease is you've got the genotype, you will get the phenotype at some point in the natural history. But that's not the case for this disease. So, so they were approaching this genetically, and they looked for what's called modifier genes that could maybe explain, you know, why some people would get the disease and others wouldn't. And this is a very powerful technique because it's blinded. It doesn't have any assumptions. And you may or may not find anything, but if you find something, it can be informative. And they did find something, but they didn't know how to interpret it. What they found was the same receptor that we had found, but they, you know, and which was toll-like receptor 4 and its co-receptor, was a very important influence on the disease. And that people who had severe disease tended to have one version of this receptor, and people who didn't tended to have a different version. And they didn't know why, and they published this in a rather obscure journal, and it didn't really impact our understanding of the disease. But when we got our findings and we saw their paper, we realized that we were looking at the same thing, and 
They were coming at it from humans. We were coming at it from mice. And when we looked at the genetic change in their population, it, it correlated with how high an expression level this receptor you know, was, 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 you know, had in different individuals. And people with high expression levels were at greater risk than people with low expression levels. OK, so I won't go through all the rest of the data, but what it told us was that and if the key input, at least a key, but probably we think the key input to driving the disease in people is a product that comes from bacteria in our guts. And I've sort of tried to draw that here. This might be your colon, and then these little red dots are the billions of bacteria. Now, the system that the body has to keep these billions of bacteria in the gut lumen and not anywhere else in your body is, of course, very sophisticated. You know, we've got a gut barrier, which we'll talk about in a minute. In the colon, that, that's a very thick mucus layer, and then a layer of cells that act as a, you know, as a, as a cellular barrier. And then there's a very well-developed immune system that is quite specific to operation in the gut. But we also know that small numbers of bugs can escape the gut, either as intact bacteria or as just pieces that you know, somehow get through the wall and then get picked up in the blood. Now, this is a vanishingly small amount. You know, like if you were thinking of a percentage, it would be 0. 0.0000, like 10 zeros and a 1%. But, but it happens, and it happens on a regular basis. So what we have found is uh, the mechanism, at least in mice, for, for driving this disease is that a tiny number of these bacteria or their product escape the gut and get into the blood. And that although we're looking at a disease that happens almost exclusively in the brain vasculature, the driving signal for that disease originates in the gut. And I won't get into the molecular part. We've also worked a lot on that. And I think we're the lab that figured out how this happens in the brain. But the key is that the input, the upstream input, wasn't identified. And it's a very unusual and unexpected input. OK, so um, what does this mean? Well, the mice tell us a few things that the humans haven't yet told us. Maybe they will. I think they will. but you know. It's a lot faster to do this in mice. So the first thing that the mice told us is when we started with this serendipitous observation, the mice in facility number two were just as healthy and happy as the mice were in facility number one. They didn't have no, they weren't free of bacteria. They had all the bacteria that you would expect a mouse to have, just as they did in facility number one. But it turned out that there was a qualitative difference in the bacteria the types of bugs they had was different. And um, so they had, they had billions, just like the other one had billions. So we, you know, we did, you know, in the last 10 years or so, the microbiome has become of interest. So you know, the facilities at Penn and elsewhere have developed ways of sequencing and characterizing the types of bacteria in a gut. And we looked at this, and uh, we looked at this in our mice, and we asked, well, is there a difference in the quality of the bacteria in these two populations of otherwise genetically identical mice? And the difference was, not too surprising, very similar to the receptor story for people, in that the, the type of bacteria that make the ligand or the activator of that receptor were more numerous in the first facility than, than the mice in the second facility. Something about the environment, and we can speculate about that, but it doesn't matter since none of us are mice, um, had changed their bio and had skewed it away from the gram-negative bacteria that were driving this and toward a more neutral, what we would call microbiome, that didn't drive it. So this told us a few things, I think, um, and that, we th that we're testing in people, but we don't yet know. First is that this is a big environmental factor. Um, it's debatable whether and to what extent it's under our control. And it's also, we don't yet know how to, you know, how to control it or, 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 or even how, how varied it is between individuals, between families, et cetera. But that even what would seem to be not huge differences in this microbiome could have a very, very profound difference in the clinical presentation, in our case, of mice. So when we looked at these bacterial differences, 
there were indeed more gram-negative bacteria, but we're not talking like no gram-negative bacteria in the animals that had no disease. They had plenty. They just had, you know, I would say 50% less, maybe 25% less. And, and I think that's consistent with a lot of what we know about the disease. There are sort of a, like a lot of diseases, you know, the body will buffer change. And then there comes a point at which the buffering system breaks down and then disease begins to arise. But if you can get back into the range where the buffering system works, then there is no disease or, or less manifestation of disease. So what this tells us is that if, you know, we think one reason that some people have disease and others don't with the same or equivalent, you know, genetic mutation is that they are, have a different microbiome. It seems likely that over the lifetime of all of us, we're going to accumulate enough DNA mutations that, you know, these, especially if you have a familial form of disease, you will get deficient endothelial cells. That's just a mathematical certainty. You know, you have millions and millions of endothelium in the brain. They do not turn over. They are subject to wear and tear, just like everything else in the body. And even though the genome is very big, the, the math is there. At some point, one or more endothelial cells will take a second hit. So we don't think that's a huge source of the variability. Mathematically, that should not, that does not seem to be something that would vary that much. But the biome does seem to be a source of that variability. So um, the studies that are ongoing now are really to look at people from families with the disease and try and determine if people who present with symptoms that are severe enough to you know, merit clinical attention, maybe even surgery, have a more pathogenic biome, just as the mice did in one facility versus another. What we'll do with that information, we, honestly, we don't know yet. Because it's not, you know, even though the biome's been implicated in a lot of different things, how to manipulate the biome is just not yet understood. And, and I can tell you, even in mice, it's not a fixed thing. Uh, the, when we did these studies, the other thing we learned, mice are much more uniform than people, of course. We have them living in a cage. Um, you know, they eat the exact same food every day. They're in the same place every day. And yet, even in mice, once the mice start living in different cages, even in the same facility, even next to each other, their biomes begin to diverge. So again, so what to do with this information, I think will take a long time to figure out. But I think it will be a, a valuable sort of entry point to, to at least understanding who's, get, you know, who, who's at risk and, and maybe eventually changing that risk in a way that makes sense for the disease too, because this is a lifetime disease. You know, no matter what drug or what clinical trial ever shows any efficacy, it's never exciting to have to take a drug for the rest of your life. There will always be issues with that. Um, so this is a potential non-drug therapy. So that's the first thing I wanted to talk about. And those studies are ongoing. And we're working with uh, a bunch of groups around the country to do that. And NIH has been pretty receptive to, you know, to funding this work. OK, so the other thing that, you know, that comes from this model is that if we all have billions of bugs here, but almost nothing in the blood, then one might think that a rate, another rate-limiting factor in disease mechanism would be how many move from here to here. And, and we th so that was something that, unlike the human microbiome, we thought we could get a handle on much more quickly through uh, studies in mice. And so uh, this paper is coming out. It'll be out, I think, by the end of the year. So what we spent the last couple of years working on was asking whether the gut barrier is important. And the gut barrier is not much better understood than the microbiome, but it's certainly much more easy to, uh, to in interrogate in, in animals. And as I told you, the gut barrier has you know, a couple of components. The gram-negative bacteria that we're talking about are almost all reside in the colon. You have a small bowel and a large bowel. The small bowel is the small intestine where you absorb food. And then, you know, when you're done absorbing food, it goes into the colon. And there you absorb mostly water. And then the kind of unabsorbed food just becomes stool. And um, in the colon, there's a thick layer of mucus, 
that is responsible for providing a physical barrier between all the bacteria that are in the stool and in the, in the gut and the actual body, which you know we try to keep sterile or at least under control. And so we did a bunch of manipulations of the, uh, that, you know, both genetic and non-genetic in mice. And we indeed found that changing the gut barrier, weakening the gut barrier, could significantly accelerate the disease. So that was the first thing that was interesting. And that was not too surprising because, it, it, you know, directly, it directly came from the previous studies. But then we asked ourselves a more interesting question, which was, is there any evidence that this already underlies some of the variability in people? And unlike the microbiome data, which is going to take many years to address and maybe, it's, maybe be more difficult to establish true cause and effect, this turned out to be a little more straightforward. So as many of you already know, it's much worse if you have familial disease to have a CCM3 mutation than a CCM1 or a CCM2 mutation. And it's been known for quite a long time by clinicians that familial CCM3 disease will present early in life, often in childhood, with you know, neurologic symptoms. While CCM1 and 2, often will, it's very variable, but people tend to be much older. So we, we, we knew about these data, and we also knew from work we'd done that CCM3 participates in pathways that are molecularly distinct from CCM1 and 2. So it plays a critical role in the CCM complex that's important in endothelial cells, but it does other stuff. So we wondered whether CCM3 might be important in the gut, independent of its interaction and, and function with CCM1 and 2. And to make a long story short, it is. CCM3 is very important to secrete that mucus layer. And when we delete CCM3 but not CCM1 or 2 in the gut, we get a really reduced gut barrier. And we, you know, in mice, it's very elegant. We have ways of removing a gene in, in a very tightly, spatially controlled manner. So we can take, you know, unlike in people where things just happen stochastically, and that's just the natural history, we can take the genes out in the cells that line blood vessels only, or we can take the genes out in the cells that line the gut epithelium only, or we can do some combination of the two. And, and we did that for all these genes. And what we found was that CCM3 and CCM3 only is required to maintain this gut barrier. It has a completely separate role related to a different molecular mechanism that is required to secrete the mucus. And you secrete copious amounts of mucus. I and mean, people have done live imaging of this. It's crazy. It's just getting spewed out. It's a constant keeping up with the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the gut function. And this is almost uh, certainly the reason why CCM3 families are, um, are more affected, because even losing one out of two CCM3 alleles, um, we found in mice, was uh, reduced the gut barrier by more than 50% and would have a, a very significant impact on CCM disease. So um, the other thing that came out of that, um, which may be more uh, actionable, is, you know, we then asked, is there anything that we know about diet that can affect the gut barrier? And indeed, there are uh, preservatives that are called emulsifiers that are used in many foods that, you know, to keep them, you know, to keep them at, like in shelf life for a long time. Stuff like Twinkies or, you know, donuts in a, that, you know, that would be wrapped in plastic and sit on the 7-Eleven shelf for six months before you bought it. This, these emulsifiers, I don't know the chemistry, but these emulsifiers keep those donuts from falling apart before you buy them. It turns out that there was a Nature paper that came out a few years before our study that suggested that these emulsifiers would also affect this mucus barrier. And we also tested that in mice, and we confirmed that. Um, so, I mean, uh, one other sort of slightly actionable information then is that, you know, diets that are rich in these highly preserved foods might impair the gut barrier more than diets that aren't. And that, that could lead to a more rapid disease mechanism. You know, we haven't tested. Go ahead.
Yeah, we thought about that a lot. In theory, there should be. Um, I would say more with Crohn's, because Crohn's is a colon disease, and ulcerative colitis is a, is a small bowel disease. But the numbers are too small. I mean, I, you know, and I, I doubt that that will really be something that the majority of families in this room would need to worry about. I think that is probably, there's no evidence in any study, CCM or otherwise, that probiotics really do anything that would necessarily be helpful. Um, I, I don't think, I think there's not, I mean, there's not a lot of data either way. The only place where things like probiotics have been valuable is in the treating of a disease called C. difficile, which if you have to take antibiotics for weeks on end because of a severe infection, then what happens is your gut just gets cleaned out. And, and then that opens up space, so to speak, for bad organisms that normally would not live in the gut because the, you know, the, 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 um, the ones that you, you know, normally live with would crowd them out. But there's no evidence now that probiotics are really that helpful. I would, I would not recommend using them. What about gram-negative specific antibiotics? Yeah, that's something we've thought about. And in fact, I didn't mention it, but in the mouse model, we can completely prevent the formation of CCMs in the neonatal model with antibiotic treatment. The catch is simple. In the mouse model, we do this for about 10 days to two weeks. In humans, you'd have to be on antibiotics for the rest of your life. So, while I think in theory it's quite a reasonable thought, I can't see how to apply that information clinically. Even in the most acute growing lesion, most lesions that change very acutely do so by hemorrhage. I consider hemorrhage to be a process distinct from lesion growth or development, and we have no information or evidence that this would affect hemorrhage. So while that's in theory really quite true, it's just not practical. You know, we have to, in the, the mouse model is a fantastic model because it's so fast. We can turn it around and do it again and again in each iteration, change one or two things, get large ends, get really solid information, and know that it's right. But that's, in, and in humans, but in humans, people can't be on antibiotics forever. You're gonna have to have a gut biome. That's how nature meant it to be. Um, what we're hoping to get is enough information to see if, you know, there are biomes that we can, you know, characterize as pathogenic. And then, you know, hopefully this field, the biome field in general will progress. And then if we understand how to manipulate it, it's possible to, you know, try and push it toward a non-pathogenic. The equivalent of having moved you from the first facility to the second facility if you were a mouse in our colony. You know, you, you'd be fine in the second facility while well, you'd be dead in the first facility. But, you know, we don't know how to do that yet. So that's not actionable. Yeah. So just to sort of ask you, it, it sounds as though it's, it's a question of equilibrium. Everything is, yeah. <laughs> No, you see, pathogenic, no, and the simple, I mean, for example, the biome, let's go back to the mice. The biome in the first facility, we've, we've had mice in that facility for 20 years. They're perfectly happy. They live normal lives. The only thing that changed was the CCM phenotype when we changed facilities. So it's not like a biome that is pathogenic for CCM disease would be pathogenic in any other way. We're talking about, these are all, quote, normal biomes. And I think if you didn't have this disease, it wouldn't matter at all which one you had. 
Um, that's assuming all of this translates to patients. So, um, no, I don't, I don't see it that way at all, unfortunately. Um, does diet change biome? Probably, but we don't know how. So it's like the probiotic question. You can do stuff, but doing stuff that, doesn't, that you don't understand is never a great idea. And, you know, uh, so I, I, I'd say that we're just going to have to wait until this is better understood. It will be very hard to understand. You know, again, environment is something that's hard to control. So it, it will take a while to get this. Yeah, I think that's the one actionable item. Emulsifiers are probably bad. And probably, and now again, if you've got, if you're perfectly healthy in every other way and you eat Twinkies all day long, you'll be fine. Well, you won't be fine, <laughs> but you won't get CCM disease. <laughs> but, but, you know, so there has to be a susceptibility. And I, it's not like um, when we put mice on emulsifiers, they, you know, their guts blew up and they died. They just, this is just something that in the context of this disease had an effect. All right, go ahead. Yeah, we've done those types of experiments. That would not formally be considered epigenetics. I mean, these are not epigenetic effects. Just to be... How do you know that? Because that's not what epigenetics is usually defined as. I'm just wondering about subsequent. I mean, so genetic... Oh, this, so just to define what epigenetics is, you know, there are, there are genes that are getting expressed, and then there are factors that control gene expression at higher levels, that, you know, typically through chromatin modification. There's no evidence that we have of chromatin modification in this pathway or in this microbiome response. So do all our guts leak and that the problem is that there's a high concentration of this gram negative that could get out? I mean, That's exactly right. No, no. Um, again, you know, in the mice, we have the ability to really fool around with this. So, for example, if we take out CCM3, which we know to increase gut leak, but only in brain endothelial cells, the effect is identical to taking out CCM1 and 2. Nothing special. And that's because in the endothelium, the role of CCM3 is in cahoots with 1 and 2 in this kind of complex that, you know, we and others have worked on for many years. Then you go to the gut epithelial cells, specifically goblet cells that make mucus, and CCM3 is playing a different role. I haven't spent a lot of time today on what's happening in the brain endothelium. We spent a lot of time in the lab on that. Um, that's a whole other story, and, and we're working on, I think, um, therapies that will address some of those, you know, uh, those mechanisms that, that at, the, at the endothelial cell level. But today we're you know talking all about the, the, the environmental and biome effect. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.